The true incredible story of the sheriff in Walking Tall. I'm Richard. And I'm Gary. And these are our incredible stories. Welcome back to all of our listeners around the world. We're happy to have you here with us again for another incredible story. And I have to say, I think this is definitely going to be one of the most incredible stories we have to tell uh, at this point. Uh, To me, um, I think it is not only a story about a true legend um, that movies and books have been written about this person but it is also just so unbelievable that i'm not sure how many people could would actually even want to believe that the events we're going to talk about actually happened or that somebody could even survive the events that we're going to be uh, talking about and today we are going to be talking about sheriff buford pusser And for anybody who doesn't recognize that name, that's okay, because the film uh, that told his story, Walking Tall, came out about 40-some-odd years ago. So uh, some of you may have seen it, may have heard it. Some of you probably weren't even in existence when that film came out. I know I wasn't, but uh, the reason why I'm so aware of the film and the story of Buford Pusser would be due to the fact that you, Dad, have actually met Buford's family and uh, you were able to sit down and talk with his deputy and not only find out who Buford was as a person, but start to unravel the unbelievable life and death of Sheriff Buford Pusser. Yes, that's right, Gary, and it was uh, one of the moments uh, in my life that I will remember and treasure forever. I uh, dearly love these people in uh, McNary County, Tennessee, who I became uh, friends with. Um, And uh, you have to realize that when Buford Pusser was alive and uh, doing some of the exploits for which he became famous, we were in the middle of a horrific war, the Vietnam War, and the, the country was simply torn apart by that war. And America needed a hero. Oh, and I think they found one in and Sheriff Buford, Buford Pusser. Pusser became America's hero. And here's the other thing, uh, Gary. I find it it's quite a coincidence that uh, in my travels through life, I'd end up coming in contact with not one but two law enforcement officers who died under mysterious circumstances. That first one, as you know, was Sheriff Pat Garrett, who killed Billy the Kid. Right, which you you spoke to his son, Jarvis Garrett. We played that in an earlier episode. Yes, and I, I dearly loved my, my time with Jarvis also. Uh, some of these people whose stories we're telling, um, I have fond memories to this day, and I miss them. They're gone now, but I, I truly miss them to this day. So uh, Sheriff Pat Garrett was the first sheriff that we talked about who died under mysterious circumstances. And unfortunately, that's also the fate of Sheriff Buford Pusser. Mm -hmm. Uh, So tonight, we're going to uh, tell the true behind-the-scenes stories of that crime-busting Tennessee sheriff who, as you noted, was made famous in uh, not just one, but three walking tall films. Three walking tall films. Mm -hmm. Now, before we get into the story uh, about Buford... Um, let's talk a little bit, uh, real quick about some of the myths. Uh, now I don't know if you're, you know, all all of the details, but, uh, according to the movie and some of the photos I've seen Buford before he was the sheriff of McNary County, was it? Yes. He was a, a wrestler. Yes, he. Uh, in fact, even before that, he was a United States Marine. Okay, so those those are true. Those are also mm-hmm. in the film, but those are true. Now, is it true that um, when he came into town, according to the film, uh, he was very upset with how things had evolved in his small town since he had left? Uh, we're talking about uh, prostitution, illegal gambling, bootlegged uh, liquor, and moonshine. Uh, and and that he went around trying to clean things up on his own and and took uh, matters into his hand almost in a way a, a vigilante was uh, would 
before becoming sheriff. Is that true? I think probably uh, you're under the influence of Hollywood on most of that. <laughs> okay. Um, because, and, and by the way, uh, you're going to see him carrying a big baseball bat in some Yeah, in the movie. But uh, forget about that. Uh, that uh, That's not something that happened in real life. Um, I think, uh, you know, he came home, um, uh, you know, and decided he wanted to uh, do something uh, different with his life other than be on the road as a, a traveling wrestler. And so um, he just uh, happened to fall into an opportunity where he could run for county sheriff. He didn't have any prior law enforcement experience, uh, but the uh, folks in that county decided they wanted to give him a chance. And you're right, that county did have a, a good deal of organized criminal activity going on. So that was true. That the, Yes, that was true. Uh, and uh, so the, the county, uh, the folks in that county decided, uh, let's go ahead and, and give him a chance and and uh, see uh, what he could do. And <clears throat> it wasn't just uh, that they were picking just anybody. This guy was a mountain of a man. I mean, oh yeah, he was big. He was six foot seven inches tall, I believe. He uh, and I mentioned he'd uh, been a marine, the professional wrestler, and, and so he just seemed the, the perfect choice to be uh, the county lawman in this rural Tennessee county. So he got elected. Uh, unfortunately, by the way, uh, he was not reelected. He never they never gave him a second term, but um, he did get this uh, one term uh, during which events occurred, which made him an American hero and incredibly famous uh, to this day. Now, before we go into this any further, Gary, let's warn our listeners. Oh, yes. yes. Tonight's episode does contain graphic violence, and it may not be suitable for the younger listeners. Yeah, I... Uh, if you are also very squeamish, uh, we went over this with uh, Jarvis Garrett, too, because he went into descriptions about what happened to his father when he was assassinated. Uh, there are going to be uh, actual recordings that we're going to play of Petey Plunk, uh, Buford's deputy, and he goes into very graphic detail of uh, the ambush uh, that will be the focus of this story. Yes, that will yeah, be the focus yeah. of this story. So just... Bear in mind, if, if you get squeamish, you can listen all the way up until we get to that part, and then if you have to just cut out or fast forward, feel free to. You won't hurt our feelings at all. We completely understand, but uh, I'm telling you, it is an unbelievable story uh, that we are going to, to share. So that being said... That being said, I will uh, say this also. Most of the story tonight is going to be told by Buford's close friend and deputy, Petey Plunk, and I recorded this more than 40 years ago in Buford's home. How did you meet Petey Plunk? Uh, well, now that's, um, that's a good question. And maybe if I could, I could save that for a little bit later. Okay, that's fine. Uh, maybe like tomorrow's episode. Yes, we're, we're going to fall. Tom not tomorrow. We don't do an episode every day, Gary. <laughs> next you week. would like to. Yeah. Next, next week's episode. Next week's episode. But let's go ahead uh, now and uh, talk a little bit about who Buford Pusser really is, because folks hearing that name for the first time, uh, okay, they know a little bit about his background, but right. what else? What else? Well, um, he was an extremely dedicated sheriff. He acquired a lot of bumps and bruises and scars during that first and only term as sheriff. And in the course of that short career of his, listen to this, Gary, he was shot Eight times. No, not no, well, eight not a, times. Yes, eight times. Uh, how many law enforcement officers are shot even once? He was shot in his four-year term eight times, and then he was stabbed seven more times. And he still lived. Not only did he still live, he still got in that patrol car every day and patrolled McNary County and enforced the law. Um, and a fleeing moonshiner one time even actually hit him with a car <laughs> right now the man is sounding more like the terminator yeah yeah I, and less like a human being but i on, mean on the other hand he was no stranger to pain i mean he must he must have had some uh, huge county hospital bills uh, his back was broken in three places uh, he required 192 stitches after a, a particularly vicious stabbing and he had also been beaten by some pipes and wrenches not to mention being shot. So I have to ask you, Gary, do you think his county sheriff's salary is worth all that? No. No. And we're talking like small town. I seriously doubt he made anything close to what he deserved. 
No, but uh, nothing in his past, however, ever uh, you know, prepared him for what was, uh, we're about to describe or what Petey Plunk is basically going to tell us about, uh, which took place in August of 1967. <clears throat> now, um, for this part of the uh, story, as I mentioned, we're going to rely heavily on the words of Petey. Mm. And while we're all listening to this interview, we're going to hear Petey ask a question of someone, and a woman's voice is going to kick in. That's the voice of Helen Pusser, Buford's mother. So everyone be, can be on the lookout for actually listening not only to Petey Plunk, the deputy, right. but also Helen Pusser, uh, Sheriff Buford Pusser's mother. Mm -hmm. So here's how the story starts, Gary. <clears throat> when that phone started ringing shortly before 4.30 in the morning, Buford Pusser had been in bed uh, only for about an hour and a half. I guess he didn't go to bed till about 3 o'clock. Uh, and... Then he told his wife after he put the phone down, there's some trouble down near Hollis Jordan's place. And his wife, uh, his wife's name was uh, Pauline, and she had also been awakened by the call. And she said, Buford, I want to go with you. Now, Pauline Pusser pretty much knew her husband pretty well, Gary. She worried about him. I've already given you a dozen or more reasons why she should be worried. Somebody shot eight times, stabbed seven, beaten with pipes, wrenches, back broken, 192 stitches. I think she had cause to worry, don't you? Sure. And so uh, she, uh, she was concerned, but uh, something else was on her mind also. Um, he had been involved in a fatal gun battle at the state line, and we're going to be talking about that next week. So um, he had been involved in a fatal uh, gun battle, and ever after, it was a gun battle with some of the organized crime in the area, so ever after that, he started receiving threatening phone calls, and, and Pauline, frankly, found them unnerving, and, and who wouldn't? So mm. that's why on this fateful morning, she said, Buford, I want to go with you. Now, Buford Buster knew that something else was on his wife's mind. Today was the day that they needed to start packing for a trip, a vacation trip, to a rural a place in Virginia called Hayside, Virginia, to visit her parents, his in-laws. Now, he knew Pauline would be nervous about him staying out on patrol all, all day long, so <clears throat> he agreed to go ahead and, and let her ride along. So, slipping into a white blouse and uh, dark brown slacks and black loafers, Pauline picked up a country music cassette, and followed uh, Buford out to his patrol car. When Buford checked his 41 Magnum and glanced at the automatic shotgun next to his knee, Pauline loaded the tape into the cassette player, which was below the dashboard of the patrol car. Buford's late model Plymouth was soon roaring down that country road at 100 miles an hour. As it approached uh, New Hope Church, the conversation uh, was centered around tomorrow's trip to Virginia. Buford never saw the dark-colored Cadillac until it was directly behind him and about to pass him. At that moment, his heart started to pound. His law enforcement instincts started to kick in. There was no legitimate reason for someone else to be barreling down that winding country road a hundred miles an hour. That was probably his only thought before a blaze of gunfire erupted. And much later, Pusser would recall that he saw three men in the Cadillac, two in front and one in the back. And the passenger in the front seat was the one who opened fire with a 30 caliber rifle. Pauline had been hit and was slumped in the front seat, but Buford's first thought was to take evasive action and get away from the deadly gunfire. When Pauline started to make some gurgling sounds, he pulled the riddled patrol car over to tend to his stricken wife, and out of nowhere, the gunman reappeared, opening fire again. The patrol car windows disintegrated into a thousand shards of glass. Deputy Petey Plunk is now going to recall for us what happened next. I guess you would call him a greedy person as far as giving up to anything, any kind of punishment or anything like that. Buford didn't give up to it. He was, he, he could 
stand more than most people. Uh, I don't think, uh, I, can, I can't think of anyone right now that, that, that could do what Buford done the day that Pauline was killed. Because uh, they did overchange his blood. When I talked to him that morning in the emergency room of the hospital out here, the blood wasn't just, it wasn't just running out of his, all of this here. All of this, this was just the strings hanging down to his waist, all underneath his tongue, and the blood was gushing. And uh, they gave him nine pints of blood in Memphis. Now, this is not counting the blood they gave him out here at the hospital and in route to Memphis. And uh, Buford was the type of person that uh, the only thing he was after and the reason that he pushed himself to go as far as he did after he was shot and Pauline was dead was to try to get the people that had done it. That was the, the only thing on his mind at that minute is to get a hold of them. Just, he never thought of a gun, he didn't think of anything, but just to get a hold of it. Now, I don't think this was ever brought out, but Buford got a hold of the gun barrel of the gun that shot Pauline and, 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 and him. He got a hold of the gun barrel, and Buford's arm was blue from almost to his elbow to his wrist, where he was a hold of the car after he had been shot. The car lunged. The guy was sitting there with the gun in the car, or working the bolt on the carbine. It was a 30 caliber carbine, and it had jammed. The only thing to save Buford's life there was because the gun had jammed. They was working the bolt hall and get out of here, get out of here. There was three people in the car. There was two people in the, the driver, and the guy that done the shooting was in the front seat, and there was another person in the back seat of the car. It was a blue Cadillac. And uh, the car lunged while Buford had a hold of the gun barrel. And where the post in the car is what caught his arm and blew his arm down as he lunged, you know, to take off. Buford said that he uh, blacked out for a minute or two, which I'm thinking myself that Buford probably blacked out for a longer period of time than what he thought. He thought it was a minute or two. It could have been 10, 15 minutes. Because the shock of Pauline being dead, the, the shock from the impact of his face being blown off, well, he could have been there a good bit longer than he thought. Mm -hmm. He said he didn't, he didn't even know that he had walked behind his car, but there was a blood handprint on the back deck lid of his car, where his hand had been there. He had talked to the back of the car. He didn't remember that, but the blood was there with his handprint there to show it. And, uh, of course, he, Buford, he was trying to, trying to catch the car. That was the biggest thing he was after, is getting that car, getting the people. And he drove 10, 15 miles with his face in that shape, and had Pauline's head laying in his lap. He had two lobes of Pauline's brains in his hand. And when he got out of the car, when the Amos met him, he laid the two lobes of brain in the back floorboard of his car. And uh, I covered up some of Pauline's brains down there on the road, in the ditch, where they shot her the last time. As I was saying, when they shot her, the first time she fell over and began groaning, and grabbed Buford. But Buford drove approximately two miles. She thought he had lost him. And Pauline began gurgling. He thought she was crying. And he stopped his car, opened the car door, stuck his leg out to where he could turn. And he lifted her up off of him. As he raised her up, the blood was trickling out of her hairline down her forehead. And about that time, the car pulled up to the side of him again. And Buford was holding Pauline. And as the car pulled up, Buford looked around, and that's when they hit him. Two bullets hit him in the, the left side of his jaw, their lower jaw. And as his head went around this way after they hit him, he seen the whole top of all these heads go off. Come off. Of course, the windows were all shot out of the car, and Pauline's head fell over, out over against the car where the window would have been there. 
and that's when the part of her brain fell out because the whole top of her head was gone. And uh, there was one hole in the windshield of the car. It didn't blow the windshield out. And the back glass wasn't blown out of the car. There wasn't a bullet but below or above the window line of the car. Every one of them went through the window. One up, I can get the bottom edge of the door there, you know, just to it. The only window that wasn't blown out was the driver's window because Buford had to roll down. There was a hole in the windshield. There was bullets in the dash of the car. There were bullets holes. The back glass, it was, you couldn't even see to it. It was daubed with blood, bones, hair, brains. The seats of the car were completely covered in blood, brains, and bone, teeth. The floorboards, front and back. I believe I'd be safe in saying there was an inch and a half of blood in the whole floorboard of the car. Of course, with the TBI, we tore the whole inside of the car out. Hunting a, a whole bullet, but we couldn't find it. Just slivers of them where they'd exploded, you know, the bullets had them in it. Buford drove the car then from where it happened onto the state line, across the state line, or close enough to the state line that he could see the plantation club, which is gone now, to see if this car was sitting there. He didn't see the car sitting there, so he come up 45 highway to the top of the hill this side of Jordan's place. There's a long bottom there. He looked, he could see across the bottom, and he didn't see any car lights or anything there. He didn't see any car. He turned back. He went back to the state line with intentions of hitting the state line road, which goes far as the state line down there. But by that time, he had lost so much blood, he began blank, you know, blacking out. And he blacked out, and he come to himself. He was back down there where he had got shot himself and where they finished falling off. And he come to himself again. And all this time, he was trying to talk on the radio, of course, but the under part of his tongue blowed away and no gum or no teeth or anything in the bottom there, front. They'd just get a word out now and then that you could understand. Which uh, the chief of police at that time, Hugh Kirkpatrick, he uh, understood Buford enough to say 45 South and ambulance. So he got the ambulance and uh, he himself went down there. The other side east two years of what they used to be the Midway Grocery, a little grocery store used to be there. That's where they met Buford. Then. He had come back up 45 Highway and got that far back when he met the ambulance. And I uh, got to the hospital before they carried him on to Memphis. And Helen, I believe you was there at that time when I got there. I'm not for sure about that. Oh, oh, yeah. 45 ounces. That's the word he got. About it. Well, when I got there, uh, I went in there to talk to him. And he told me, said, uh, New Hope Road. And I could just get a few words now and then he was saying that I could understand. And he said they told me if, if I didn't find it at New Hope Road to come to Jordan's place. And they would tell me about it. But he was saying other things during this time, but I couldn't understand what he was saying. And he told me that Pauline was dead. And other than that, that's about all that I said to Buford that day that I could understand, you know, what he was talking about or anything. As unbelievable as it sounds, Sheriff Buth Buford Pusser did the unthinkable. Petey tells us that Buford put the patrol car in gear, raced after the fleeing killers. Uh, however, his wounds were so grave that he would soon have to pull over. He passed out from loss of blood, and that's how Petey found him. At the time, Buford didn't know it. 
but he was about to become America's national hero. Lionized in that series of films by Bing Crosby Productions. And it's always going to be, for me, Gary, a source of great pride to know that I had a small part in creating that legend. A few years after his death, I wrote an article about Buford Pusser for True Detective magazine. Bing Crosby Productions, as I noted, found uh, uh, Buford Pusser's death an interesting subject also. However, when Walking Tall Final Chapter was eventually released, I only recognized factual material in the last six or seven minutes of the film. The rest, uh, in my opinion, was pure Hollywood baloney. Well, that's what they do. <laughs> yeah. So uh, for years after my magazine article was published, I remained in contact with both his mother, Helen Pusser, and his deputy and close friend, who both of whom became my friends, Petey Plunk. Now, I never uh, intended to write a magazine article, so the story behind the magazine article is also worth telling. It was my first piece of investigative journalism in which I explored the possibility that Sheriff Buford Pusser was murdered a few years later after this event this evening that we're describing took place. And that will be next week's incredible story. Pete Plunk will be back, and he's going to help us explore that mystery. Yes. So uh, we're going to cover how... Now, we're going to cover next week the the idea, the theory behind him being murdered, Buford Pusser. But let's let's scroll back a little bit and and talk about the ambush. Because to me, I, I don't know how anybody in that kind of a situation, you've just been shot in the face, your jaw is hanging by a flap of skin, you have, your tongue is not even there, you can't even speak, your wife is dead next to you in the car. How do you push yourself to keep going? What, what drive and I know in newspapers there's uh, been articles and, and books and all that about people who get the superhuman strength or energy, you know, mothers that lift cars up off of their child when they're pinned underneath them. But what makes a man so driven that he can maintain consciousness, focus, and, and pursue these, these men that did something so horrible? I have no explanation whatsoever, and because... I have no idea of anyone else who has done anything similar. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's not to say that a story like this isn't floating out there with somebody else, but it's just so incredible uh, and how tragic, you know, their, their drive out there was to take care of a situation. Obviously, this was all part of that setup for the ambush. Uh, they knew he was going to be on that road. Somebody made the call to get him to come out of the house. I'm sure they didn't expect him to have his wife with him. They were probably just focused on targeting him, and she was just an innocent bystander in this this whole situation. Um, but I think any any other person probably would not have made it out of that situation. No, I, a lot of people wouldn't have even survived it. Now... When you were talking to Petey, how did he describe Buford to you? Because a lot of times when I heard about Buford, uh, I'd seen some interviews, and I'd, I'd heard him talk in a few uh, recorded interviews. He seemed in much the same way that Pat Garrett was kind of a soft-spoken uh, person. Buford also seemed like he was kind of a soft-spoken person and a man of few words. Is that what you kind of gathered from his family and friends? I don't uh, recall uh, them, you know, describing uh, Buford that way. Uh, I will say this, however, um, his wife, not his wife, but uh, his mother was a very wonderful, soft-spoken, polite, courteous, old South-mannered lady. And I also saw that Petey Plunk deeply loved her, as he did Buford. So um, we can at least say that Buford Pusser was a 100% human being. Absolutely. Now, when you go to the town, 
correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't they turn his mother's house into the Buford Pusser Museum? Yes, uh, that is now today the Buford Pusser Museum in Adamsville, Tennessee. So if you're interested in this story uh, and you would like to learn more about Buford Pusser, there's more than enough articles online. There's lots of videos you can find on YouTube about it. But if you're in Tennessee and uh, you really want to get a firsthand glimpse of uh, the, the man that walked tall, the, uh, the true legend, Buford Pusser, it might be worth your time to stop in there and, and take a glance at that museum and see what it was all about because, I mean, uh, as unbelievable as the movies are, I think uh, his life was even more unbelievable than anything Hollywood really could have dreamed up. Oh, exactly. Exactly. The movies didn't even compare to the real life man. No, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. Uh, I, I think it would be worth them doing a, a sequel, not like the one they did with uh, with The Rock. I'm That was, I'm sure, uh, an entertaining piece of, of fiction, but definitely not the story we talked about today. So next week, join us for the second half. We're going to talk about how he died and, and the circumstances that... Uh, led a lot of people to believe that it wasn't an accident, but but something that was definitely a planned murder. So, once again, I'm Richard. And I'm Gary. And this was an incredible story. <laughs>